I feel as though I want to go home because I can only disappoint you now after that amazing introduction. Um, I have so many people to thank. Um, Risa, um, for the introduction and the privilege of having this chair. Amazing um, leadership and a friend that I know will last for a lifetime. Um, I want to thank my mentor and the person responsible for me having a teaching career, and that's Mildred Robinson. I would not have. thought, um, a kid from the South Bronx, I would not have thought to do this if she hadn't called me and said, you should do this. Um, he's not here, but she also called John Jeffries and said, she's a kid from the South Bronx, I think she's going to need help. Um, and they together sat with me and taught me what a job talk was, and so I want to thank them uh, both as well. Um, my torts professor is not here, um, but Mike Dooley uh, also said, she's a kid from the South Bronx, she's going to need help. Um, and he helped me, and I am so grateful. I get to return um, because my friend Barb Armacost and my friend Ben Spencer were on the uh, appointments committee uh, and they marshaled the um, efforts of the committee um, and Dan Ortiz called me and said you should come back. Um, it was such a long shot um, in my imagination that I could convince my husband to move away from Colorado that I have to thank him, <laughs> thank him, thank him for coming back east. Um, I really do love it here. Um, my brother has known me longer than anyone on the earth. Um, he never fails to humble me in public, <laughs> as he did five minutes ago. Um, but I am so grateful for my family, my colleagues, and my friends. Thank you for listening to my work. So I'll get on with it. Um, there is one more person that I feel very um, much obliged to. So this is Robert Margenthau, and nor normally, um, I would say thank you um, and move on quickly. Uh, but he was the district attorney in New York City in 1975 when I was in high school. And through 2009, he was a legend in my community. Um, he was a legend because he saw fit to prosecute crime that was white collar crime as vigorously as he prosecuted crime on the street. Um, his children went to high school with me um, and when I called him to thank him for being um, uh, the namesake for my chair, despite the fact he was 98 years old, he corrected me on all kinds of details. I invited him to come uh, here to hear this lecture. He said, oh, Dana, I would, but I've got an event on the 26th, and I don't think I can make it. Um, but he literally um, changed my view of law enforcement in New York City, and I would not um, have imagined that I'd have the honor. Um, so if he sees this, because he did say he was going to see the video, thank you so much for all you have done throughout my life, including being the namesake for this chair. Now, um, let's see if I can make it go forward. I want to talk at... <laughs> Oh. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about medical legal partnerships and specifically about how they are preventive lawyering. So preventive lawyering, that's a term that's odd to you, I'm sure, but you are familiar with the term preventive medicine. Preventive medicine, of course, means that you go see a doctor, maybe for a well baby check, maybe for an annual check, but you do it well before any crisis ensues, before you're very sick, before you have to go to the emergency room, before any chronic illness occurs. Preventive lawyering is much the same. The idea being that interventions legally would occur, what we call in sociology, upstream. And by upstream, that means before crises evolve, before people become sick, we would intervene and provide lawyering in ways that improve health care. So that's going to be the theme of my talk today. I'm going to look at, because my research looks at, ways in which being 
accessible, uh, having access to legal services actually improves population health outcomes. So I'll do it in six sections. I'll talk first about the background and the significance of this problem. I had a conceptual model in mind and I'll share that with you. There's a part of this as we talked about or you heard in the introduction that is related to my dissertation, that's the research design. And I'll share that with you because my objective there is to give you evidence that my claim that lawyering improves health, especially for vulnerable populations, is true. I'll then talk a little bit about the methods and results before I return to implications both for us as lawyers, for us as social scientists, and for us as people who want to improve lives in the United States. So the background and significance. Many of you are already familiar with this quote that Martin Luther King is attributed with saying at a Congress that met in 1966 on civil rights and humanity. He said that inequality, when it pertained to health, was the perhaps most cruel and unjust form of inequality. As a lawyer, I am fundamentally concerned with inequality, with injustice, with treating people differently on bases that are unsupportable and avoidable. And so this is the basis or the principle that drives and informs my work. Let me tell you about a few examples of the type of inequality that I concern myself with in health. Health disparities, that is, inequitable outcomes that are not clinically supportable, that are not driven by the preference of patients, but rather are based on, as I said, unjust and avoidable criteria. So two examples. Many of you know that infant mortality is one of the most important measures of the state or status of a population's health. In the United States, we measure infant mortality by the number of children in a population who die before their first birthday per thousand live births. So that would be the rate of infant mortality. And we could do that for the entire country, or we could break it down by population. In America, African American women experience infant mortality. They lose their children in the first year of life over two and a half times more frequently than white women do. Now this, you say, might be attributable to a lot of causes, but the real concern with this data and this example of disparities, as with so many, is that once we control for income differences and education differences, that might explain the differential access to treatment, to healthy lifestyle and food, those disparities persist, leaving us with the concern that it might be something based on race, ethnicity, national origin alone, as lawyers, protected and suspect interests, that we don't want people to have differential health outcomes based upon. A second example, you may recognize that this is Serena Williams and her child. Maternal child deaths are also similarly disparate in the United States. And it is not possible to explain this by the usual confounding factors that we control for. It's not possible to make these disparities disappear just by improving or controlling for income or controlling for socioeconomic status. And so again, we're talking about an inequity and inequality that remains of concern because it may be best explained by race and race differences that are non-clinical, non-genetic, and non-biological. So what could these differences be? The conceptual model that I've been working with is based on work that was first published in 1991 by Sir Michael Marmot. He did a study of 15 years worth of longitudinal data looking at the health outcomes of civil servants in the UK. The important contribution of his work was to show a direct relationship between health 
and socioeconomic status. So this is an example of what his work showed us. It was called the social gradient in health. On the x-axis you see from left to right low socioeconomic status to high economic status and on the y-axis from bottom to top low self-reported health outcomes to high self-reported health outcomes. The fact that this relationship was linear and predictable led Sir Michael Marmot to write a book that has literally transformed the understanding of public health, public health law, and public health research. This is a copy of the second edition of that book called The Social Determinants of Health. So why the social determinants of health? The wisdom of Michael Marmot's research is exemplified in this photograph. So many of you will recognize it from the flight that was the subject of a movie but landed on the Hudson River where airplanes are not supposed to land. <laughs> there were 155 souls on board, but if you look closely, even though the picture is fuzzy, you'll see that there are two groups of people exiting this plane and looking for rescue and safety. In the front of the plane are the people who were in first class. In the rear of the plane, a much larger group of people who were in cabin or coach. What do you notice about the difference between the people in the front versus the people in the back? Well, first there are fewer in the front, but they have the luxury of a life raft. They also have life jackets. They also have a better chance of getting out of the Hudson River alive than the people in the back of the plane. This is an example of what Michael Marmot's research showed us. And that is that place matters. That health is not dependent solely on access to health care or access to health insurance, but it is dependent perhaps more importantly on one's social context. Where you live, where you eat, where you work, where you play. That determines whether you have access to good healthy food, whether you have access to decent, clean, and affordable housing, whether you have access to built environment spaces that allow you to take your physician's recommendation seriously when he or she says, exercise, get outdoors, eat better food. Well, it turns out that we have many theoretical estimates of exactly how much place matters. And this is an example of one of the best estimates and you'll note that while genetic and biological information accounts for maybe 10% of how healthy you might be, and your access to clinical care similarly accounts for maybe 10% of how healthy you might be, that big dark blue pie slice describing social and economic factors, where you were on the plane, actually accounts for much more than we have ever been known before of health outcomes. And so my research looks at how law organizes, distributes, and makes equitable access to these things called the social determinants of health. Because the social determinants of health, it turns out, are where the action is, where vulnerable populations will most likely see improvements in their health and therefore reductions in health disparities. So how do we incorporate law and the information that Michael Marmot's information told us into the delivery of health care through medical legal partnerships that practice preventive lawyering? So here is a model that graphically illustrates what I hypothesize a medical legal partnership can do. So just to give you background for those that don't know my work in this area, medical legal partnerships are exactly what they sound like. They are joint endeavors between a legal provider and a healthcare provider to offer a new delivery model of healthcare. So again, lawyers 
and doctors together deliver health care in a primary clinic preventive medical setting. The theory being that when a doctor preemptively identifies, say, exposure to asthma, it will do no good to send that child back home to an apartment or a house that is pest infested, that is laden with lead, allergens, and toxins, that is not meeting standards of habitability, is not meeting building code regulations. So there is law available to improve the setting, but unless a lawyer is a part of that medical team, we'll send the kid home with albuterol, we'll send the kid home with a good diagnosis, and the kid will not get better. So medical legal partnerships in those types of instances are essential collaborations for improving health outcomes. Now just to give you an idea of the way in which theoretically medical legal partnerships would help, you see that they're pointing to a central circle that describes social determinants of health and how they're distributed. So here comes the reason law is so crucial here. Remember the social context is responsible far more than any other in the pie graph we looked at earlier. Everything in that social context is organized by law. It is distributed by law. And maldistributions in housing because of discrimination, in education because of disability, in food security because of zoning laws, all of these maldistributions are corrected by legal intervention. So again, the conceptual idea is that, as Michael Marmot showed, poverty and race will automatically lead inevitably to inferior health and social outcomes unless something disrupts it. And the idea, conceptually, is that medical legal partnerships can do that. They can disrupt the social gradient in health. So there you have the conceptual model. Now let me tell you a story about a kid that we used our legal services back in Colorado to test the model. So pictured here is a kid I'll call baby Eduardo. And Eduardo is with not his mom or dad, but with his lawyer in this picture. And they're smiling because it's his lawyer that helped him to get access to health care. So Eduardo's wearing a trach, and he's wearing it because he was born with a congenital obstruction that required him to have the breathing tube until he was three years old, old enough to then have an operation that would permanently allow him to breathe independently. Why did he come to the medical legal partnership? Originally, he came because he wasn't covered by Medicaid in the jurisdiction where he lived, and so he didn't have access to health care. And that was a legal question of sorts, because he had been denied and we could help him with the appeal. Upon a little bit further investigation, we also found that Eduardo was in trouble because his family was about to be evicted. Why were they going to be evicted? Because they had asked their landlord to move them to a larger apartment than the one bedroom, actually studio apartment, where he lived and all of his equipment was overrunning their life. Because mom and dad were undocumented, they received a threat that either they paid up or shut up and an eviction notice. So that was the second legal problem that was potentially a harm to Eduardo's health. The third legal problem was again his parents' legal status. So the fact that dad would go to work as a day worker during the day, he'd get picked up as many undocumented immigrants in Colorado do, and he'd work for a day and come home at the end of the day, and the odds were about even as to whether he'd get paid for that work that day. And so the questions they asked us had to do with the financial health of the family, the access to health care for the family the access to a living space that could accommodate the family. 
and all three of these legal questions were directly related to baby Eduardo's health outcomes. So what I research in my paper, my dissertation, and hopefully here at the Medical Legal Partnership that we formed in Virginia, is whether these medical legal partnerships actually improve health outcomes, right? They're a great idea. Many physicians, especially primary care physicians, love them because they are well aware that they come across social problems, legal problems, that they're not taught in medical school or equipped as practitioners to, have, uh, to help. And so I structured a research design that asked this simple question, do medical legal partnerships actually improve health? Does having a lawyer intervene in primary care preventively actually demonstrably and measurably improve health outcomes? So to get at that, I did several levels of research. I'm going to tell you about two. But just so you know the entire model, we did means comparisons of populations that did not get medical legal partnerships with populations who did get medical legal partnerships. And then we did a more narrowed means com comparison. That's the matched comparison. And I'll tell you about that match. The idea there, essentially, is trying to find people in the control population who are so similar to those who got medical legal partnerships that nothing could explain the differences except for the intervention, the medical legal partnership itself. Then we did what was called pre-post studies, before and after the medical partnership, examining whether it made enough of a difference in the outcomes we were looking at. And lastly, a mixed method study. I'll talk least about that, but it's of interest because for each of the patients in this study, I also had a legal aid legal file. So I could look at the cases, the details about how they were treated legally at the same time that I was looking at the details about how they were treated medically. And that gave me some more information, some of which I'll share with you now. So that's the research design. So I know there are too many words on this slide. <laughs> and that you're going to be reading this slide instead of listening to me. But let me tell you essentially, you're going to see four slides like this and they are about outcomes of interest. What does that mean? That means those are the measures that I was looking at to see whether medical legal partnerships actually made a difference. So I picked these four outcomes because they were theoretically and practically connected to the type of legal services that our medical legal partnership was providing. And so the theory I was testing was if there really is a benefit to having a lawyer then I should see some change in these outcomes of interest. So the first one, inpatient hospital stays. Again, if I am right that medical legal partnerships improve health, then kids in my study should end up in the hospital less frequently than kids who are not in medical legal partnerships. Why might that be? Well, again, if they're going to a healthcare provider preventively, getting upstream help for the things that might lead to chronic disease or hospitalization, I would expect or predict that I reduce the number of hospital stays for kids that get this intervention as compared to kids that don't. Second outcome of interest, the second thing I was measuring to see if I could see a difference in medical legal partnership interventions, missed appointments. Now I actually looked at a lot of indicators like this on the theory that if a medical legal partnership is doing its job, a kid is actually going to the hospital on a regular basis for lots of reasons. Maybe my legal intervention improved the family's financial status by helping with an employment dispute, giving access to workers' comp. Maybe my legal intervention actually did no more than make the family feel more in control, have more mastery of their lives. And in fact, we saw that quite often. Maybe my legal intervention supported the family so they had discretionary income that allowed them to buy the transportation, to negotiate with confidence a day off. In any event, if I saw a more regular pattern of accessing preventive health care, theoretically I should see healthier kids. And so I wanted to see whether there was an association between the medical legal partnership and that outcome as well.
third outcome, immunization compliance. Well, this follows logically. If the kid is going to the doctor more regularly because I have done the things legally that would help the family have more income, more access to transportation, more control over their work lives, then I am expecting not only that immunization compliance will rise, but this indicator was particularly important to me because of the data that tells us how much better children's health will be over the life course if they have complied in the first three years of life with the immunization recommendations from the CDC. And the last thing I was interested in was a social outcome. I chose upward mobility because again, the data is really clear that when kids, especially vulnerable kids, kids from populations that are underrepresented by law and have underrepresented access to health care, when those kids are able to get residential circumstances that are stable, then their social networks are stable, their access to food is stable, their family situations are stable, but oh, if they're not only stable, but mom and dad are doing better each year, maybe I've helped them with their employment. As a lawyer, maybe I've helped them solve some financial problems. Whatever the intervention, if they can move from a neighborhood that is a lower median family income neighborhood to a higher median family income neighborhood, they're gonna get better schools, better access to groceries, better environment that will inform and improve their health. This turned out to be really important. I'm gonna go off script just for a second because when I was in Michigan with Debbie Stabenow, it was exactly at the time of the Flint, Michigan crisis. And one of the things we found out about place mattering in Flint, Michigan, not only the lead issues that you heard about, but the housing issues that you heard about, but there was in Flint, Michigan, not one single major grocery chain. Like there was no Safeway, no Kroger, no Piggly Wiggly. There was not a supermarket in the place. In order to get to fresh vegetables, in order to get to food that was not from a 7-Eleven type convenience store, because there were highways bisecting both north and south in Flint, Michigan, families had to take two buses if they didn't have a car. So, Upward residential mobility seemed like an important indicator. If I could get medical legal partnerships to improve upward residential mobility, then lawyers would make a difference in health outcomes. So I'll speed through this part because it's the methodology part. Remember I said I matched populations. The treatment population, the people in the study who actually got a medical legal partnership with people who were like them. Why did I do that? Well, for the scientists among you, the ideal would have been to do a random clinical trial, right? To prospectively assign some people to get the medical legal partnership randomly and then compare them to people who didn't get the medical legal partnership and therefore understand in the best possible way by the gold standard that the difference between these populations could be attributable to having a lawyer in your healthcare model. Well, I came to the data after the fact. The medical legal partnership that I was investigating operated at the Children's Hospital of Colorado from 2009 to 2013. So as a result, I retrospectively had to create a control group population. So if you're with me, the control group population wasn't prospective, it was retrospective. So how did I do that? How did I match the two populations? Propensity score matching is a method that lots of social scientists are using now to simulate as closely or as nearly as possible a random clinical trial. And without getting too much in the weeds, the theory is this. There are a group of eligible participants. In my study, there were 31,000 plus patients. There are some allocated to the treatment group. In my study, 1,077 patients actually got the medical treatment. The remainder of the patients were eligible to get the treatment, but we don't know how similar they were to the people who actually got the treatment. And so we look at a series of pre-treatment variables. Covariates, we call them. 
criteria that describe people in both groups so that I can match them patient for patient on different variables like what's your average temperature, the age of the patient, the race of the patient. And then I had lots and lots of data. I ended up with 200 variables that I could try and match. Most of them didn't work, but I ended up with a lot of variables that allowed me to say a patient who got the treatment is very similar to a patient who didn't get the treatment and so I'm going to compare them on the medical legal ba uh, partnership grounds in order to see if I'm making a difference in those outcomes of interest. Everybody with me? Good. So enough of you nodded that I'll keep going. <laughs> in addition to the comparison we did a pre and post study. That's pretty intuitive asking whether the outcomes of interest changed before, uh, from before the in, uh, intervention, after the intervention, and then we did a qualitative analysis. And why is this a data sheet? Why is this qualitative analysis? Because you take all of the information from the legal records and enter it into a spreadsheet. And then you do analysis on things like, and this is one of the things I was most interested in, does the medical legal partnership work better if the patient gets a low intensity, a medium intensity, or a high intensity legal service? Right, so I divided the legal services into low intensity. You came to the legal office and you sat down, got counseling, got education. Low impact, we sent you away better off than you came. You and I do that when we have a legal question. We call a friend who has a, lawyer, a law degree and we say, what about our taxes or what about our real estate deal? Lo, lo, lo and behold, low income patients don't have that access. So giving it to them as a medical legal partnership service was a low impact intervention. So moving along the continuum, maybe I wrote a letter to an adverse party, right? Like we did for baby Eduardo. The eviction notice went away. All we did was write a letter from our law firm, dear uh, landlord. We've made, we're, we're made aware of the situation of the so-and-so family, we'll call them the Rodriguez family, huh? and we understand that many families in your development are in the same position. Here's the law about eviction. Here's how you violated it. If you'd like to make this right by date certain, we'll go away quietly. Otherwise, we'll be interviewing everyone in your housing development. And lo and behold, no more eviction, right? So I'll tell you more about the outcomes, but that's one I couldn't hold on to. I might get a further in uh, more intensive service if I appeal an adverse decision. We got lots of these kinds of cases, right? Termination for public benefits, uh, adverse immigration decisions, adverse workers' comp decisions, and then personal appearances. I actually had to go to court, or my students more correctly, actually had to go to court. So I wanted to see if it made a difference what level of service these patients received. And here are a sample of my results. So first, the bad news. Did it make a difference with respect to residential mobility or vaccination compliance? No, not really. I couldn't find anything that was definitive because of this column right here, you realize that my p-values, that is, that tells me whether I have statistically significant outcome, they're too high. So I could neither rule in nor rule out that those two variables made a positive difference. That's the bad news. There was good news, and I will tell you what it was without showing you on a slide. That is the other two variables did work. We saw that with respect to inpatient hospitalizations, patients who got a medical legal partnership were 33% less likely to have inpatient hospitalizations. We saw that with respect to missed, canceled appointments for doctor care, Patients who got medical legal partnership services were 98% less likely to miss their appointments. So my theory would be that these patients actually had access to health care. Their health care was earlier available to them. And why? Because we had an upstream intervention in providing medical legal services for social determinants of health. So let me tell you also about the qualitative outcomes. That is the outcomes from the medical records. There were three of moment. First, we
we saw that there was a direct relationship between having a lawyer and having a winning outcome. Baby Eduardo's outcomes were not unique. We had a win-loss ratio to beat the band. So if a patient and their family came to us with a problem of a legal nature, we almost always won. You might say that we were shooting fish in a barrel because these were low, uh, complicated cases. They weren't. Uh, some of them had to do with, for example, finding a way to win an immigration court that would give a patient access to public benefits. We did some refugee and asylum cases that absolutely made all the difference for whether mom, dad, or patient had access to health care. So the win-loss ratio was very high. Secondly, we also found out that the intensity of medical services, excuse me, the intensity of legal services was inversely related to the outcome. So the patients who got the lowest impact services, right, they got counseling, education, and we sent them out the door. That was the group of patients that got the best outcomes, or more frequently got good outcomes. Now we won a lot of the cases that were involved in personal appearance, the higher intensity invent interventions. But our win-loss ratio was way higher, and the outcomes were way better with the lower level interventions, like a letter to your landlord. The third qualitative outcome was perhaps the most disturbing. And that was that there is a serious justice gap, at least in Colorado, but documented nationally for low and modest income patients and families. What does that mean? The way it showed up in our data is that a patient would be screened as I described, would be taken in by retainer agreement into the legal aid office, we'd identify their legal problem, and then we wouldn't be able to serve them because we didn't have capacity. So the number of cases in our files where a family had a problem that was within our expertise that we should have been able to solve in order to improve their health outcome was nearly 12%. That's too high. And that just means that poor people don't have access to justice in Colorado. And if my theory is correct, that's one of the reasons they're less healthy. So I'll close now with some implications. The immediate implications of the study for the two out comes of interest that work mean that if medical legal partnerships are working right, they get people to the doctor earlier and more often. That improves their health. If they're vulnerable, that decreases health disparities. Secondly, if medical legal partnerships are working right, they go into the hospital and it turns out into emergency rooms less frequently. They therefore are less costly to treat and therefore helping uh, to reduce health disparities. So the immediate work of this research shows that there are some positive implications to having a lawyer in improving the health of populations who are vulnerable. However, there are broader implications with respect to equality and equity in healthcare broadly. That's because of the fact that most of the social determinants of health that have been shown statistically to have the biggest bang for the buck to have the most impact on health outcomes are also the ones that are most often maldistributed. Think housing. Segregated housing is very highly correlated with poor health outcomes in America. Think affordability of housing. When a family spends more than 30%, some cases 50% of their income, because housing has become unaffordable in their region, that means they have to trade off where they spend money and evidence shows us that they trade it by buying less food, especially if they have children. They tend to buy less food. They trade off by not going to the doctor. They don't have the transportation. They can't take the time off of work. And so when we step back and look at the inequity in social determinants of health, for me emerges a legal strategy to improve lives individually, but also to improve lives on a population basis. This is the focus of my research, probably for the rest of my time here in Virginia. I want to look at the ways to make health system equitable 
to take the legal concept of equality and translate it into interventions that will help upstream determinants of health, help distribute them, help organize them, help give access to those social determinants, to populations that need them most. What will this mean as a policy matter? Well, first it means I have to convince the health profession to deliver integrated health care. To integrate not just a lawyer in their health system, but also a social worker. So that the low-end problems, like your food stamps were uh, discontinued, that doesn't take a lawyer to solve. Those problems are solved by social workers on the team. So that there's also a dentist and a behavioral health specialist. That's what we call the integrated health care model. And it's beginning to catch on, especially in primary care, especially in federally qualified health centers. But in order to make that the national model, lawyers have to help accomplish payment reform. People provide the health care that they're reimbursed for. And right now, reimbursement is controlled in our country in a siloed manner. That is to say, private as well as public insurers pay for what is quote unquote medically necessary. Well again, if the model of social determinants is accurate, then we need to broaden what is medically necessary so that it's not just health care or medical delivery. After all, recall from the pie chart, that's 10% of the story. But if we really want to improve the health of vulnerable populations, our legal system has to account for value-based payment that is not per patient, per member, per month, but rather is reformed to encompass a broader concept of what healthcare is. And then ultimately, we've got to expand the population who can get to the doctor. And so Medicaid expansion, such as the debate that's going on in Virginia, is an important part of the conversation. So why do I have a picture of the Broad Street pump here? Well, those of you who know any of the Broad Street pump story know exactly why I have the picture here. And that is because all I have been talking about is an area of law called public health law and research. What does it mean and why does the Broad Street pump matter? Well, this is the story of a town in London during the mid-1800s where cholera outbreak, where there was a cholera outbreak. The medical profession thought they knew exactly what caused cholera. It was airborne. The medical profession was exactly wrong. Cholera is not airborne. There was one doctor, John Snow, who thought that the real reason for cholera in London was because of contact with filthy, dirty, water, sewage, and all manner of disease-ridden particles and toxins. And where did he think they resided? On the Broad Street pump where everybody got their water. And so he studied, actually beginning the study of epidemiology, the populations in the neighborhoods of the people who came and used the water from this pump. He traced the people who traveled into the town to get water. And he looked at their vital records. He looked at the number of deaths. He looked at the births, the ages, the discharges from hospitals. Actually, he was the father of modern epidemiology. But in order to do his work, he had to have the co cooperation of the legal authorities in London to get the data that he needed. Well, a long story short, epidemiology was born. John Snow proved to be correct. And the first medical legal partnership collaboration between law and medicine actually stopped the cholera outbreak in London. There's lots more to that very interesting story, but it animates everything that I do and everything that I study. I have to say, though, that the best payoff is when, as is the case with baby Eduardo, the outcomes are really good. Not only did he get another apartment, but he's reached age three, he's had his operation, he's now breathing freely. We couldn't get mom in status, but we got dad in status, so I'm pretty sure he gets paid for the work he does from now on. They moved out of the apartment that we saved them from eviction in. 
they ended up in a two bedroom apartment that they could now afford because their income would support it. And this picture shows moving day. It is the essence of interdisciplinary collaboration. So there I am with my law student. Of course, I have my arm around the law student, right? Next to me on my right, your left, is dad. Mom's next in the picture. The guy with the sunglasses on is the legal partner of this other lawyer that you saw in the first picture. Who are the other people? The woman in the white t-shirt is a public health student. The woman with the baseball cap is a medical student. And the lady attending to baby Eduardo is a community health worker. That's my idea of integrated health care, where all of us collaborate. We deliver care upstream. We do it preventatively. And I think that's the way we will reduce health disparities in America, and certainly the way we'll make better life for Eduardo and kids like him. Thanks for listening.